Hi, I'm Ranger Jonathan. I'm out here in Shenandoah National Park, up at White Oak Falls. So what's actually behind me is a tributary of the falls. And today, we're going to be exploring water and where water comes from, where it goes. So water is a great universal. You, I, all living things need water. And we don't just need any water, we need clean water. Water that is not polluted. And so we're going to look today at this watershed behind me and look at it. So the water that is here, it's been moving, changing through hundreds, thousands, and even millions of years. And it's been changing the world around it too. So you're probably familiar with the water cycle. As the water moves, it changes. All of the water that we see here was rain at one point. This water is, doesn't come from a spigot anywhere. It actually comes from a spring that is solely fed by rainwater. And that rainwater has all fallen here in Shenandoah National Park. But where that water's on a go is one of the things we're gonna look at. So let's take some time and look specifically at the water right here. Let's look at how it came here, where it's going, and why is it specifically right here. So all of this water is in what we term a watershed. Now that's a term you might not be familiar with. A watershed is an area of land in which all of the water that is in that area will drain into a body of water. Now a body of water can be a lake or a river or creek like what I have behind me. So this is specifically a creek. This is Tim's Creek here in Shenandoah National Park. And it is a tributary watershed. So all of the water that drains in the mountains around it flows down and eventually joins with the White Oak Canyon watershed, which is part of the Robinson River watershed. Now, an easy way to think about watersheds is to think about a sink. So let's go explore a sink back in the education office to show you that analogy. Welcome to our education office where we're on a look at watersheds. So when we were out in the field, we were talking about them, but let's get a better visualization of what a watershed is. So our sink right here is going to represent our watershed. And I have a handy dandy spray bottle right here full of water that will represent water coming from rain or other sources that is going to enter our watershed. So what we're meaning in this, in a watershed, any water that lands in the sink will eventually make its way down the drain. So no matter where I spray this water, it will always head towards that central body right here in that center. Now, if I were to spray it up on the counter, that's outside the watershed. You'll notice that water is just staying up there versus if I aim it at the side of the sink where it then goes down into the sink. So now that you have an idea about that, let's go back to the field where we can look more at watersheds in the park. So like that sink analogy we just saw in which all of the water that hit the sink went down the drain, all of the water that hits the rocks and the hillsides behind me drain down to this little creek and eventually it flows out that direction. But it doesn't just stop there like our sink. Our sink, it flows down the drain and then we don't worry about it anymore. But here watersheds are a little different. They're kind of like Russian nesting dolls. You have the smallest one, then there's another one around it, and another one around it, and an even bigger one. And that's the way watersheds work. Here, this Tim's River watershed is a small nesting egg that then flows into the bigger Robinson River watershed, which is part of that White Oak Canyon. So let's see, once it hits that Robinson River, where does it go from there? That's the next thing we want to look at. Okay. So if we use a map, we can actually see where this water is going to continue to go. 
and as it meanders, this little tributary drains into the Robinson River right behind me, or really in front of me, behind you. And that's going to continue meandering its way. Eventually, it'll also drain into the Rapidan River, which is a, rap a watershed over to the south of me, that direction. And then, so now all these have added together. So we had the Tim's watershed, which combines with the Robinson's watershed, which combines with the Rapidan watershed, so eventually, it then flows in to the Rappahannock. And the Rappahannock is one of the large rivers in Virginia. And eventually that meanders its way till it hits the biggest watershed in Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. This massive one that includes this very large area, not just Virginia, but includes Maryland, some parts of West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. All of them drain into that Chesapeake Bay. Now the water here meanders for over 100 miles before it actually hits that bay. But what is the reason that defines where the watershed is? Why is the Thames River watershed here, but not over with the Robinson over here? Or why, if we were to hike two miles that direction, we actually completely leave the Rappahannock watershed as a whole. We then enter the watershed that goes to the Potomac. On the other side, just on the other side of this hill, all that water goes to the Potomac before it hits the Chesapeake Bay. What's the defining feature? Well, let's explore that. Let's do an activity where we can explore that. So let's go back to the Ed office. Okay, so we're back in the education office and we're going to now discover what defines watersheds besides where the water goes but what creates the edge of a watershed? So I have with me, once again, our spray bottle. I've taken off the cap so it's not a spray, but rather some drips of water. And my last tool, my hand. So it's pretty easy to do. So this is a standard hand. Five fingers, a palm, pretty straightforward. But if I were to drizzle some water, let's put water like right here it always will go down in between those fingers right there. It is always going down right there. But what if I put water here? Okay, that's going to be a different spot. Now let's try the center of the ridge right there of that finger. Okay, it could go down almost either side. We have found the edge of the finger watersheds. So it seems like these edges of the watershed is defining where the water goes. So topography, elevation, really is the defining feature for where water is going to decide to go. The watershed will tell you where the water will end up, but it's that geographical features, the mountains or ridges, that'll really dictate where your boundaries of a watershed are. So now that you have a better idea about that, let's go back to the field and explore some more. So welcome back. So as you've probably figured out, elevation, geologic features like a mountain generally are the boundaries of watersheds. So we have looked at, this is really the mouth of the watershed here for the Thames River. And mostly the mount for the White Oak Canyon or Robinson River. Let's see if we can't find where it starts, or at least where it starts on the ground and the surface that we can see. Because a lot of this water, as I said, it came from the rain. So anytime it rains around you, chances are some of that water is entering our watershed here, but it's also entering the watershed around your home. So all of those little creeks have come together to make a much bigger one. Kind of, once, once again, that Russian egg nesting doll idea, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But why, why is all this important? Why is it important to me? Why is it important to you? Well, for me, it's important because the National Park Service, one of the things we're supposed to do is protect. Protect and preserve our natural resources. On my patch, there's that lake representing all of this amazing water. But why do you care about it? Let's explore that. 
So watersheds are one of the most important things for us to consider as people because all of us are connected. At the beginning I said all of us are connected because we all need water, but our watersheds are connected. If I were to put any, like a color chemical in here, we would watch that color chemical move throughout all of the central Virginia on that Rappahannock watershed till eventually hit the Chesapeake Bay. So anything you put into the water will continue down the watershed, affecting not just yourself, but anyone else further down from you. So making sure we protect our watersheds is so important. So let's think about what are some ways that you can help protect a watershed like this one. So before we look at how you can help keep these watersheds clean, how do we know if water is clean? How do we know if this is a healthy watershed? Well, there's lots of different ways. One of them, scientists use is chemical testing. So we'll look at things like the pH or the acidity level of the water. Because water is naturally a perfect neutral, not acidic and not basic. So we can look and see, is there something that's causing that to change? Or we can also look at the dissolved oxygen or the DO and that everything that lives in the water, even fish, still need oxygen. So we need to see, does it have enough? Temperature is another good one. So we have scientists in the park that their whole job is to monitor things like this. And one of the other things they look at is actually insects or more accurately, tiny insects sometimes baby insects or larvae that are in the water. We like to term those macroinvertebrates. So let's take a second. Let's go back to the education office and look at some macroinvertebrates and maybe do some identification. Okay, so as we had said before, scientists and even you can use macroinvertebrates that you find in a watershed to be able to determine the overall water health or habitat health of that stream or watershed. So we're actually going to go out to one of our local streams here in the park and we're going to do some macro invertebrate surveys. So what that means is we're going to look under rocks, use nets to see if we can find animals that are living under the rocks in our creek. Now macro invertebrates get their name because unlike us where we have our bones on the inside of our body, Macroinvertebrates actually have theirs on the outside. So the invertebrate part of their term means it's on the outside. Now the macro in this is actually meaning small, which is kind of ironic because the Latin for macro actually means big. But in this case we're meaning instead of microscopic organisms, we're meaning organisms that are small enough that we can see them without the aid of a microscope. So let's go in and take a look at what we can find. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is this on this rock. So you'll notice we have this almost looks like a worm. He's crawling his way out from under his home that he's created on this rock. Now we can start to identify him by some of the features. One, by his shape, we know that he has legs, so he's not going to be like a snail. And he has little arms on his front end, about three of them, and there's no obvious tail. So that tells us this is probably a caddisfly. The other way is that structure he's crawled out from that we're looking at. This is a caddisfly home, a nest that they create themselves that they latch onto in the rocks. So this one, there's a couple things we can notice. If you'll notice as he's moving around, you'll see along his abdomen that there's these almost like hair like structures that are moving and vibrating. And those are gills. So we know he has those gills on the side and he has three tails. Those are all really important identifiers and that tells me that this is probably a mayfly. And here's our next one. So we have this macroinvertebrate that has two tails. I'm looking at them, I'm not seeing any visible movement like those hairs we saw in the previous one. So I'm going to say that this is probably a stonefly. Those two tails are one of the big identifiers for him. They are frequently known to have their gills along their legs, which can be a little bit harder to see easily. Okay, so this one, it looks very similar to that previous one that we had. You'll notice how he's 
very big and looks like he has armor on him. And the two tails on the back once again tell us that this is probably a stonefly, but if you've seen the difference from the previous stoneflies that we have seen, this one having those big almost armor plates on his back is probably a different subspecies of stonefly. Okay, so this one, you'll notice we have almost looks like a gelatinous mass under the underside of this rock that we found. And so this is actually not a macroinvertebrate. These are actually a clue for another species or animals that could be living here because these are eggs from amphibians. So they are vertebrates, so they aren't invertebrates. They have their spinal structure inside of them versus on the outside. And so with time, all of these eggs will hatch into tadpoles that eventually will change into either a frog or a salamander or other amphibian. Okay, this next one we have, ooh, he's a little different than anyone else we've seen so far. You'll notice, look at how he's moving. He's almost like contracting himself to move. And so I'm gonna take a guess that this might be in the leech family. I actually don't know specifically which one this is, but you'll notice in his movement structure, he doesn't have any legs or any tails like any of the other macroinvertebrates we've seen today. And he's almost a little see-through, which is interesting in and of itself. But that motion-like structure is very similar to how leeches move. So that's why I'm gonna take a guess. He's probably a leech. Oh, and here's another good one. And you might notice if you look very closely at this one, while he's the same size as our macroinvertebrates, there is a very, very almost invisible skeleton you can see through on him. And so this is not a macroinvertebrate. It is a vertebrate, and it's one of our little minnows, probably a very young minnow. And you can actually almost see through his whole body. It's really interesting. You can see his whole intestinal structure and his stomach in there. Ah, and here's one that is another one of our stoneflies. But this one you can actually, if you look, while he's on his habitat, this is where we find most of the stoneflies is clinging to rocks like this. They're not only floating in the water, but if you notice, you'll actually see the gills on his abdomen moving back and forth. And so this is a great example to be able to see those gills that are on his arm and abdomen. And here's another example of a caddis fly coming out and you can see his little home right there. And there's more amphibian eggs. So this rock actually is a great example of how rocks and streams can be multiple habitats for lots of different macroinvertebrates. So welcome back. Now that we've explored macroinvertebrates and you've learned about how some of them can tell you about the quality of the water and the health of the watershed, you can even do this on your own. You can, with permission from your parents, and then making sure wherever you're doing your stream study or looking for your macro invertebrates, make sure that it is something you're allowed to do and you get permission. But make sure any that you look at, just like we did, we return back to where we found them. But now let's look at how you can help protect the watershed yourself. And there's lots of things. There are so many things that you can do. Sometimes it's even just a small thing. Take a shorter shower or bath. If you reduce your usage of water, that's less water that we waste. It's less water that we need to clean again. There's a lot of different things. Think about how you're disposing of liquids. Rather than maybe throwing grease down the sink, look at maybe throwing it away or disposing of it or reusing it. If you want to learn more about how there are different ways that you can help watersheds, there are a lot of resources online. Virginia's Department of Fisheries and Inland Game have a lot of resources available to you. The EPA even has resources that can tell you about what watershed you're in and how your water is clean. So we have reached the end of our watersheds program. I hope you've enjoyed learning about watersheds how we're all connected by water. And I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about them as well. So I encourage you to explore your parks. Remember, all the national parks are owned by us. We, the people of the United States, 
These are our parks and they're here for us to discover. So thank you for listening in. If you wanna learn more, explore Shenandoah, our website at www.mps.gov slash Shen, S-H-E-N, and continue learning. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.